most of you know it's fairly customary that either Mike or I introduce the speaker, but seeing as how it was my father-in-law and also a retired meteorologist who lined this up for us, I'm going to have Dennis Rogers come up to introduce our speakers for tonight. Mr. Dennis Rogers. <laughs> So it gives me great pleasure to introduce Dr. Bill Gray, who will start off the talk and he'll transition over to Barry during the talk. Global warming thing is really a, a, a big hoax that has been perpetrated by the American people. I, uh, to quote uh, Senator Anhoff of Oklahoma, he said, this may be perhaps the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people. No, I think it is. Uh, you go back, uh, it, it just, not that I'm against uh, global warming or anything. If I thought CO2 could bring about the global warming, which all the media says, and the say I would be in the camp with them. I'd be to cut down fossil fuels and go to renewable energy and things. The problem is that the science just isn't there. We're not going to have global warming. We haven't had any global warming the last 15, 16 years and the we have had some warming since the 19th century this, we're coming out of the little ice age in a natural sense. Now, it's not humans that are doing it. I think it's the deep ocean currents have changed. And most of the climate change we've seen is natural. Now, the problem with going to fossil fuels, demonizing carbon, it's, um, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, um, and going to renewable energy, that costs three, five times more if you really figure it out what uh, fossil fuel energy costs. And if we go that route, we're going to lower our standard of living and it just will not be good for the uh, humanity, I think. Now, this idea, I believe, and I've been following it long. I'm 83. I've been 60 years working in the field. I've never believed it when it first came out. And I've been shouting and crying, and of course, uh, I've lost all my federal money long ago. I had money from NOAA for many times. I had a phone call from uh, uh, <coughs> Al Gore's office once uh, when I, uh, due to my work with hurricane prediction and uh, he wanted me to come in to have lunch with him with a panel and I asked who these people were. They were all global warming. I said, I'll be sure, glad to come in and talk about it, but I want to let you know I don't believe that CO2 will do the things that it is. I've been working in this area my whole career. And of course, the fellow calling for him said, well, We'll get back to you. <laughs> Anyways, I never heard of them. I, I've lost all my, uh, all my federal money and stuff. This is what happened. It's a vicious field out there, I'll tell you, with regard to grant money. Boulder, if you're associated, you know, you follow the media of Boulder, you see, uh, my gosh, uh, NOAA is for it, NCAR is for it, all the government agencies because they're getting tremendous funding to explore this climate change issue. Anytime anybody can dig up some data or show something that indicates that oh, well, CO2 may be making the, the globe warmer or changing the climate, they write a proposal up, get it in, and you'll get funded. My biggest complaint of all is that there hasn't been a scientific dialogue, an honest-to-God scientific dialogue on this global warming issue. It's been thrust on us from the politics of the top. And our government has pretty well bought conformity. And um, <clears throat> the young, uh, it, it's un incredible, the young people I see are afraid to speak out. You can't have an honest discussion this. American science, most all the 
Scientific societies have agreed this is an important problem in things. The problem is none of them know anything about the atmosphere. We have great Nobel Prize winners who say the um, <clears throat> global warming from the CO2 buildup is a great problem. How do they know? They don't know how the atmosphere ticks. They don't know how it works. And that's what we're faced with. Now, I want to, I've got a talk here, and Barry's going to follow on. It, it, it is, um, <clears throat> I, I'm, uh, I, I'm very fortunate I'm at an age, what can they do with me? I've got my <laughs> retirement. I'm devoting the rest of my life to uh, whatever years I got left to fighting this problem. And I believe so strongly in it. I'm very lucky. I'm an old guy who believes in something. Whether nobody else believes it or not, I do. So um, I want to show you. So we uh, start out, you all have heard of AGW, ag, uh, agnostic global warming. Then we have catastrophic <laughs> agnostic global warming. <laughs> do you know that the, um, we're about halfway to doubling of the CO2 now, as far as the effect of CO2 on the atmosphere goes? When you look out the window, do you see catastrophic global warming? How many of you see it? I, I, I mean, yeah, it may be a little warmer this summer, a little more drought, as if we haven't always had droughts and up and down, and it's July. What, is that what you... My, my local vision is not a global vision. Okay. okay. What I see going on in my yard is not relevant to the rest of the world. You've got to take Well, yeah, that's right, surely, certainly, and that's why somebody in South Denver reports, I've, I've lived here 80 years and I've never seen such a hot summer at my house. It, does, it, it has no meaning. Now, here's what you get in the textbooks. This is unbelievable. This is what a, the college students are all being shown, that when CO2 doubles towards the end of the 21st century, we're going to have this kind of warming. The tropics is going to warm 2 to 4 degrees centigrade to higher latitudes much more. This is ridiculous. There's no way this can happen. Um, now, here's what we're talking about. The, here's CO2. You've probably never seen a graph of the total CO2 and how as the years go by this has gone up here. And you see this is, we're talking about this little amount of energy here driving these tremendous climate changes. And now don't be scared of this figure. This is a figure of the energy budget of the Earth. And I just, with these are in various units, you know, watts per square meter. You don't have to know about this. But here's the amount of solar energy coming in. Here's the amount of albedo reflected to space. Here's the amount of long wave going in. Here's all these fluxes, energy fluxes at the surface. Now, when you double CO2, it's a 3.7 of these units. That's all. It's just a little bit. And you're saying that this 3.7 is going to drive this whole climate system all of which these terms can change. The IR to space, the amount of rain, the amount of all these other terms, condensation, warming, and cloudiness, and everything. They can change and have a bigger effect on it than any CO2 has. So now the effect of CO2, you see, as CO2 goes up, it's blocking of long wave energy to space goes up as a logarithmic power, something like this. As the, as the CO2 goes up, the temperature rises more at the beginning, less at the end. It's not exponential. It's not linear. So now let's look at what's happened since this. The background revolu uh, um, since the pre-industrial revolution of about 1850, we see that this CO2 has built up like this. It started out about 280 
uh, parts per million by volume. Uh, by uh, uh, 1958 uh, or 9, it was about 315. It's about 400 now. And people are demonizing this. This is terrible. The world's going to come to an end because of this. And uh, so we're up to the point now where we are about 51% of the influence of doubling CO2 on the atmosphere. So we should be seeing about half the effects that the uh, 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 doubling comes forth with. Yes? What were the measurement technologies used in 1850 compared to now? Oh, uh, uh, they weren't as good, but this is probably a, a fair e estimate. They have other, many other things. This is a fair estimate. So. Um, now, the problem is, where did all the hype on this come? Oh, where did all the hype come out from this? It is primarily come by numerical models, climate models. They got in and they started making these climate models. Now, it's impossible to predict the climate in the future. The atmosphere is so complex, it just can't be predicted uh, with any accuracy very far in advance. And I want to show you the problem is, but it can be predicted under short range conditions. We do have much better progs. I'm, I, I, one of the greatest advances I've got since I entered meteorology in 52 and 3. I wrote my first paper in 52. I've been around a long time. My brain isn't quite um, uh, dead yet, though. Uh, so um, the, e the ECMWF, which uh, is an European Center for Medium Range Prediction, they have probably the best forecast uh, unit going. And they have shown recently, last year, skill out to 10 days in predicting the weather. Ten days, they can verify it. Now, the climate models go much further. Now, the way they get to scale out to ten days is primarily with the new satellite and all the measurement techniques, uh, you measure the wind patterns and the pressure patterns, and you can extrapolate and uh, advect these along pretty well for eight, ten days or so. That's the secret of it. However, when you get further along, go out to these longer time scales, you have all these energy problems. Air-sea interaction, condensation, heating, evaporation, cooling, cloud-cloud, free radiation differences. It's a can of worms. You just cannot forecast the future very well. Now, if they could, how many of the climate models from NCAR or Washington or around the world make climate forecasts for next year or three years or five years from now? None of them. Because they're afraid if they put that out, they would be verified and they would lose their credibility and they don't do it. So they give forecasts 50 years. 100 years, 75 years, they'll all be dead by then. A wonderful forecast. Numerical prediction just isn't possible, but that's what's been driving primarily the science behind the global warming issue. Now, here's the climate system. I mean, look at it. Now, do you think you can write code and put this code in and integrate it every 15 minutes for 100 years and be able to predict all these components? It's a can of worms. You can't do it. It just isn't there. The climate models, no matter what they say, are no damn good. And they're all wrong the same way. They all give warming. They all, it, it's sort of a, a group think type of thing where they all uh, back each other, say their model is going this, and when they write papers, they review each other's papers, they scratch each other's back. 
with a grant proposals and things, and it's a closed-in society that's not realistic, and it just isn't working. Now, <clears throat> what is the, uh, the, the, the physics behind this thing? The physics behind it came out of this uh, famous Charney report. He was a great uh, meteorologist who, who was instrumental in starting early numerical prediction. And that's been a success out to three, five, eight, ten days. Great success. <clears throat> so the idea was, well, numerical prediction has worked very well. Not so much whether it's going to rain in Boulder tomorrow. That hasn't. There hasn't been much advancement. But whether a cold front or whether the next five, ten days are going to be colder weather or something, that has advanced greatly. So um, what has come out of it is, that they thought as CO2 built up, it would warm the atmosphere. And as uh, this would warm the atmosphere, maybe one degree C if you doubled it. Actually, it's about half a degree because the ocean will contribute energy. And then they said, here's the crux of the error, the water vapor feedback loop. They said, as you warm the atmosphere, the ability of the atmosphere to hold more vapor becomes greater, which is true. But it doesn't mean it will become greater. And it, uh, in the upper troposphere, as facts, the atmosphere does not become more moist and block more radiation to space as the temperature builds up. There's this so-called classius clapeyron equation that says as the temperature of the atmosphere goes up, the ability of the water vapor, uh, of the air to hold water vapor goes up exponentially like this. However, the measurements in the upper troposphere show that as the atmosphere warms, the upper troposphere doesn't get more moist. And it doesn't get more moist because the cumulonimbus that come up with the rain have, have return flow subsidence around them that acts to dry the atmosphere. So here's one of the big physical crux differences. As you see, you enhance. We know that as CO2 builds up, you'll have a little more energy gain in the atmosphere. And this, some of this will manifest itself in extra deep rainfall, cumulonimbus clouds. And these clouds will go up and have return flow subsidence. The mass that goes up has to go back down. And um, this dries the upper troposphere and lets more IR flux to space. Whereas the models assume following the Charney argument and uh, that report, that as you get more rain, you tend to have the clouds die and weaken, and they leave over more vapor in the upper troposphere. And this greater vapor blocks the IR loss to space and warms the atmosphere. That's the crux behind it. And the measurements just don't go along with it. In other words, if you take air aloft, say take air here, this is at 40,000 feet, 200 millibars. Bring it down to 30,000 feet, 300 millibars. Start the air out 86, um, uh, saturated. As it comes down to 300, it will lose 86% of its vapor and arrive with a relative humidity of only 14%. The gradient of vapor in the upper troposphere is so great that any subsidence dries, and any subsidence lets more IR go out to space. And the measurements, I, I think I've, I've gone, so um, this is maybe a bit technical, but if you get more um, drying in the upper troposphere, you lower this emission level and you give more energy out to space than if you have higher vapor in the upper troposphere. The emission level goes up, 
And this uh, equation we all use, uh, uh, Stefan Holtzman equation, gives less energy. So when it gets dry, more energy goes to space and the troposphere cools. When it gets moist, uh, less energy of infrared energy goes to space and things get warm. That may be a bit technical. So anyways, here's what the climate models show. They all have this warmth you know, when they double CO2. They show that in the tropics, which is half the globe, the temperatures in the upper troposphere get very high. And um, they do this because they're absorbing more of the IR energy under the assumption that the vapor in the upper troposphere is much higher. And uh, you, I've taken an average of these and uh, gone over this, and uh, I've sort of looked at the data from, uh, we have pretty good data from the late 50s up to now and looked at the upper level temperatures in the tropics that have occurred versus what the global models have said they are. And what you find is that the, if you look at the global models during this period when the uh, CO2 has increased from 315 to 400, you see they get a warming of 1.33. The measurements only show this. If you take the whole doubling, they get a warming something like this. If we extrapolate this uh, to this time frame, we get about half a degree upper tropospheric warming. That doesn't mean the surface. The surface is only going to be about half that. So if we get a ha uh, half a degree warming, a doubling of CO2 in the upper troposphere, we'll get about half a degree there. We can tolerate that. Half a degree uh, are... are uh, <coughs> um, or, I mean, about uh, half a degree is not much, and I don't think it'll be that. It'll be less than that, about half of that. I project perhaps with doubling of CO2, we'll have a warming of perhaps 2 point, uh, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 degrees C, which would be overall probably beneficial for the globe. We'll also have a little more rain, 2 or 3 percent more rain that will... Uh, cleanse the atmosphere a little faster. Um, and the crops grow better. There is a, a lot of evidence out with the increased CO2 that, that vegetation in the globe is going a little better. So my uh, suggestion is we should do nothing now with this CO2 problem. Put it off for the next, the next generation will be able to look at it and handle it much better than we are. But we should take no action now. It, it is premature, and probably the buildup of CO2 will be more beneficial for humanity than detrimental. Um, so with the moisture, too, they're having the models are saying the upper levels are going to moist. The data shows that it didn't, at least during this period here from 58 to 13. This is speculation further. I won't talk on that. There's all kind of uh, problems here that I don't The One thing, the models, their grid distances are too large, and they can't handle individual clouds. And you can get up and down motion and drying here and let more infrared radiation to space than you can with these larger grids. And um, cumulonimbus clouds just, if they're more intense, they take more, uh, the uh, efficiency of rainfall is greater. You take more vapor out of the atmosphere and have less around to balance, or to be in the subsidence area and the vapor in the upper troposphere with intense CB clouds it's just greater than when it's weaker. Now I want to show you what Jim Hansen, you all have heard of Jim Hansen, right? The great NASA scientist who is out saving the world. And uh, anyways he gave this very famous talk to Congress in uh, 
June of 1988 when we had this hot summer and there was a lot of planning and everything with this and it made the press and all that. He had a model where he assumed that the upper troposphere, the vapor content, went up 50% in the upper troposphere. This was a model he was using. And that the relative humidity in the upper troposphere went up too, where we measure it now with more rain it goes down. So this is what he went to Congress for. We knew it at the time. We all said the water vapor feedback stinks. This is much wrong, but nobody would listen. They won't go to talk to people who have given their lives to studying atmospheric science and how the whole damn thing ticks, particularly me who's been in the tropics and tropical storms, cumulus clouds, and how all that works. They won't talk to you because you'll give them the answer they don't want to hear. Nobody wants it. Now, um, here's what Hansen's model gave. What his doubling of CO2, his early model, gave in the tropics, six, seven degrees warming in the upper troposphere. There's no way in hell this could happen. But that was his model, and everyone believes in models. Do you have to model it? That's the most... Uh, there's nothing, geophysical phenomena off to, to predict it just can't be modeled well. It's too complex. There's too many worms in the, in the bucket and it, it just is lousy. Um, so anyways, here's, my, here's what the CO2 model. CO2 double modeling said directly from the CO2 you get one degree warming. There's a feedback. This moisture feedback is 2 degrees, and the net warming will be 3 degrees. Now, if we had 3 degrees warming at the end of the 21st century of the globe, the globe would be much different. It would be, it would be terrible. Everything they say is true. I would be jumping up and wanting going to, to renewable energy and all that, but it's just the physics just isn't there. It's not true. So uh, our estimate is that you're, when you double CO2, the direct effect of the CO2 is not going to be one degree. It's going to be half a degree because the ocean is going to evaporate and you're going to lose energy from the ocean and evaporation. And the feedback is not positive. It's slightly negative. And the net warming, I think, will be 0.3 degrees. So uh, I don't think we have much to fear. But um, uh, you can't be heard, the, the press. One of the worst things about this whole issue is the lapdog nature of our U.S. media. They have gone along with it all along. If I hadn't been in this field, I have many talented people in other fields, math, physics, and everything. They go along with the global warming because they don't understand how the atmosphere ticks, and it seems so plausible. As the papers just keep saying, model after model, they report every damn thing that anybody models or says. Japan, there was something that said uh, the end of the 21st century, there are going to be 20 times more typhoons than there are now, because it came out of their model, and they put it in a paper. The paper will go along with it. This is the biggest, with the press has let us down on this. The American media that is often, that is the bulwark of our democracy often, that in politics it tries to get behind the problems in politics and false medical advertisement and everything had dropped the ball here completely. And, but there's going to be a shift. So now look, what has happened? Here's all these models now. This is a recent thing that are predicting the warming. This is warming here going on. The models are predicting warming, but the atmosphere is not responding. We haven't had any appreciable warming in the last 15, 20 years or so. So they're beginning to fail. This whole global warming thing is beginning to come apart gradually 
It's technically coming apart, and in time, this will filter down. It's remarkable that President Obama is so behind the curve and so backward to say the things and do the things that he has. It just, I don't know who he has in his advisor, but the politics of it is so strong. And uh, anyways, that's all. I, um, uh, I am going to say on this thing, except I, I, I want to add things. Where it has come from. Yeah, there's a new book out. Uh, uh, Barry uh, Swartz will talk about it. It's called The Age of Global Warming. It's by an Englishman. It's followed this very carefully. It's only been out last two or three months. It's a wonderful book. We have it here and uh, on our website. By the way, this website will be on our CSU. Anyone want to look at the slides with this can. But well, where it started was, was do-gooders, like Club of Rome people and all these people who were very honestly worried about the world. The world, after all, the, the, the divergence of wealth in the world is so great. Uh, revolution has to come. TV, radio, communication, all these poor areas, see how we live in the wealthy West. Let's try to alleviate that in some way. Let's try to help the poor people and transfer a little wealth to them. This is healthy for the future of the world. The problem is the corruption in the U.S. and all this stuff, you can't do that. I think the greatest contribution that, uh, that, the, that the industrial world and particularly the West and the U.S. does is that Keep inventing new medicine, new products, new things to filter down to the, to the third world. That we shouldn't delude ourselves by taking money from us and giving it directly to the third world. It won't work. Efficiency, the middleman will take it all. Uh, so um, uh, this started with this idea. And it has been going for 40 years. This book talks about it. There have been meetings. And, and because how are you going to do this? How they're driving for global government. They want a bureaucrat in Brussels to run our country. That we, the world will be better if we have global government. Then there will be more justice, unity. People can tell what is, who is making too much and who's making too little and uh, correct it. And to me that there's a lot of people seriously believe in that. They're well-intentioned people. But how do you pull it off? The only way to pull it off is to scare people. People, only people that will scare. In time of war, you can draft people, you can organize them and so on. So how do we, we pull this global scare? on the world. CO2 is going to change all this. We all must unite and organize to fight climate change. And the, high, the only way to do that is scare people. So that's my feeling. Now I'd like to try to uh, talk too much. Uh, <coughs> I'm afraid to express my views, you see. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, uh, but what are they going to do with me? Huh? So I'm going to continue to try to tell the truth as best I can. And now, it's worse than I've said. Uh, Barry Schwartz has been following this topic, too. And that the measurements, there's been contamination with measurements and all kind of problems. So uh, uh, real quick, you guys, if you want to have a conversation uh, offline, let's do that. But I want to make sure we get to some other questions. So. Eric had a question, I believe. Oh, well, all I was going to say is, is it possible that as one glacier melts, that others are getting thicker somewhere else, so the total ice yeah. mass is probably constant? Yeah. That's what's happening. Yeah. Yeah. Let's move up. Certainly the glaciers come and go. Yes, we've had recent periods at a lot of the Alaska glaciers and, and uh, in other parts of the world have melted a bit. But that's... The amount of energy involved with that is small, and gl some glaciers are melting, some are growing. Overall, 
We've been in a warm period since the uh, middle 70s up to the uh, last of the, uh, the last century, so we would expect the glaciers to melt. Now more of them, uh, the, the melt has gone down, and we should expect some of the glaciers to start growing a bit. In Antarctica, they are. Uh, Bob, I think you had the. Yeah. I just wanted to mention, you know, it's been, uh, it's probably been about 15 years, but I used to debate this. Believe it or not, this is an issue way back in the 90s. And I, I kind of I kind of gave up debating it because it's like beating your head against it. Uh, it's not a scientific debate as far as I'm concerned. It's almost entirely political, as you mentioned in your yeah. party remarks. And yeah. So one of the points that I used to make very early in my presentation, it's kind of like I was suddenly like a 15 round fight. And I throw a knockout punch in the, fifth, in the first round, which is what I'm about to mention. And then I keep debating, and people later in the debate would forget that the guy got knocked out in, in the first round. <laughs> so I learned that you throw your knockout punch, and then you leave the ring. And, and my knockout punch was very simple. You have, as you, you kind of touched on this a moment ago, you've had tremendous climate variability all through history. If you accept the existence of an ice age, of, of Manhattan being under a, a mile of ice, in order for that to melt, you had to have a higher temperature for a long period of time. Much more recently, the Little Ice Age, you touched on this. My favorite anecdotal evidence was on the River Thames in England, they used to have, up until uh, 1814, they had ice fairs. Anybody ever hear about the ice fairs? And these ice fairs, they would have these th these things, kind of like a, a little, uh, what do we have, these little flea market type things. Yeah. They'd be on the ice, they do it every year, and there were pink paintings and all kinds of things. This went on for 100 years. The last one was in 1814. You know why? Because <laughs> the river doesn't, doesn't freeze over anymore. Yeah, and the reason it doesn't, the ocean currents right. have changed, and we don't have this big blocking action in northern Europe that causes... Uh, it to be so cold in winter. These are natural changes. I, uh, there's a prevailing group think in our country on science, and uh, they, I think the media is afraid to show this because it'll go against their whole, uh, every, what everybody thinks and what the government thinks and what all the science societies in America think that you just can't, uh, this will, although the OBS aren't fitting the models, well, eventually they will. Or uh, that CO2 obviously warms, so it's got to warm regardless, maybe the models are, uh, you know. I don't know, it, it's a bit, but you no, know, it's not gonna keep going. There's a retrenchment now, you can feel it everywhere. Uh, in Europe, in Australia, in our own country, it's going to, this, this whole thing's going to uh, 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 die in a week. In 10 or 15 years, we're going to look back on this and say, how could we have been so naive to believe this stuff? Right. So I, saying, I am absolutely sure that's going to happen. So you're saying that there's no way they can ignore this? For that's right. Longer. Well, I like Lincoln. You can't fool all the people all the time. Eventually, I, I, the, I like the chickens will come home to roost. Unfortunately, this is not a scientific debate. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's all politics, and therefore you can't talk anybody into anything. You could give them facts, and it's, it's, they're going to believe what they want what they want to believe. And all I'm asking you all to believe, you don't have to believe that global warming is not a problem. I just ask you to think for yourself and understand that it's a very complex problem and it's not as as straightforward as the media would like you to believe. And, and another thing about the media on this global warming issue, I find it very interesting that this story comes and goes. When there's a lot of stuff in the news, you don't hear about global warming. When we have a slow news day, this is a very convenient topic for them to pull out and say, you know what, we don't have anything in the news, let's bring back this global warming thing. <laughs> The, the media likes to make people hysteria and hysterical. And that's what I think. I think it's political, and I think the media is making a lot of money because people like to read stuff about this. And from my experience, I haven't been able to convince anybody. Once, once people hear something, like my mom's this way. She's heard there's so much on TV. And I've tried explaining stuff to her that it's complicated. She goes, well, if 
Al Gore said it, then it must be true. <laughs> we got a question back here. Yeah. Uh, there's a narrative out there that says that uh, because of climate change, we're seeing more intense storms and British storms. Is your experience? Oh, <laughs> just the opposite. Oh, well, that's 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 what I cut out a slide, and I had. Um, this is absolutely poppycock. There's nothing to this with tornadoes, hurricanes, everything. As a matter of fact, with hurricanes, the last 20 years, the global average of them has been going down somewhat. And if you look at the U.S., uh, you can see the number of landfalling major hurricanes over the last 94 years has been going down as CO2 has been going up. This is, uh, they'll turn to anything. I mean, when, uh, when the globe doesn't warm, they turn to severe weather. They turn to this, they turn to that. It, it's, uh, uh, it's awful, it's awful. I just can't believe that, uh, that people will defy the observation. I mean, just go against them, and uh, some of the reason is because the, uh, they get grant money to do it. That's what's in. What's in in government is global warming, and we've got to do something about it. If you want to play ball and get money and continue with your research, you'll play along with us. That, it, is, it is awful. It is awful that, in my view, that objectivity is thrown out the window in the name of better politics. Casey? I, I agree that the objectivity has been thrown out the window, and I just kind of want to remind everybody that we're all guilty of this. We've got a, a very well-studied, very well-versed individual here who tells us it's an extremely complex issue, and the human proclivity is to dive in and find the evidence that justifies our position and deny the science. We're all guilty of that on every side of the spectrum. I, I would agree. Right. I hope you're right. In we all years. want a simple answer. Yes. That's right. And I hope you're right in another 10 years that we see it go a different direction. Now, I, I am, uh, yes, uh, I will be pushing up daisies. You remember what, what we some said. Good ones for <laughs> Second point is that there has to be, and this is stretching it a little bit, there must be a global conspiracy because every country I've been to is following this global warming process. It's there not just America. It's called bigger government. It's not bigger government. Right? Government so always wants bigger government. Along the idea of a That's global government, along the idea of globalizing your government, that in itself is another human yeah. proclivity and they can use global warming to get there. That's right. That's right. Government likes it. They can control us more. That's right. So, uh, Dave, Dave. I'm curious, are either of you scientists familiar with the newsletter out of Cave Junction, Oregon called Access to Energy by Dr. Arthur Robinson? Yes, I am. Uh -oh. Arthur Robinson is a hero of mine. He's fought this problem right along. He's a great guy. Were you and he exposed to the, the petition project? I, I Well, I signed it. I didn't do all the work. He did all the work, yeah. But he, he's done marvelous work. There are many heroes out here trying to fight this global warming uh, uh, abomination. And they're being, uh, you know, and they take a lot of heat. They, people jump on them. You, uh, you know, there are all kinds of stuff. It, it, it's become a very heated thing. It's like the McCarthy uh, era. Have you now or have you ever been a member of any organization that says that humans are not altering the weather? A quick point and then a, a question. So to, to correct this gentleman over here, my first research paper I ever wrote was my senior year of high school in 1977 was on climate change 
the debate back then was, are we going for global cooling oh, yeah. or global warming? That's they right. had no way of knowing they, they, until they saw which way the temperatures went. Then they said, oh, it's global warming. Wait a minute. And they yeah. jumped on that. I hate to do, hate to do this. Where's the? Oh, let me just say something. Well, I gotta, I gotta say something on that. Where's the pointer? It wasn't there. Or I saw this. This says exactly what. There was a newspaper article that came out and it said the glaciers are melting, sea levels are rising, temperatures are going up, people are getting alarmed. And 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 then it, it said it was the New York Times in 1917. Yep. Okay. Somebody at a conference that I've been to showed a graph showing the number of articles discussing global warming and global cooling as a function of year from 1880 and it's like this. Okay, the media has been hysterical about the upcoming ice age and then it goes to global warming and we're going to melt and then, you know, it. this has been going on for a hundred years. Okay, it's, it's been Global, it was the famous uh, uh, Time magazine cover of the gentleman with his beard freezing, and it said, Ice Age, you know, and we've got to be scared about the Ice Age. So we've gone from 1977 to 2013. Actually, it started in the, the 80s. It was only 10 years later. They, they flipped in 10 years. Yeah, I, I would like to point out something here. Uh, damn. It's a very quick question. In 19... What's your question? Oh. My, my quick question is that if you have a theory, there must be some way to present evidence to disprove it. But is, it, is there any evidence that can be or has been given that has been accepted as proof of not anthropogenic climate change of some form? Well, that means we would have to understand. We would have to know exactly what is the, con the natural contribution to climate change. Okay. What, does, what do the oceans do? What do all the other factors? We have a, a radiation budget there. Is that, well, is that well enough known? I believe it should be the other way around. I think those people that propose CO2 as this big problem should show proof. Proof is not showing me the glaciers are melting. Okay, that's antidotal evidence, but it's not proof. No, but they take, the, they take but everything they that be, happens in the climate as proof right. of man-made cause. But I, but I, want to see a, I want to see statistics. I want to see from observations other than the, the, the glaciers melting. And I want somebody to tell me what, what are the contributions from natural variability. Until we understand that completely, how do we know what's the human part? We only know the total. We know the temperature's going up. It's gone up since 1970, but do we know what the <laughs> natural part of that variation has been? Is it really correct to say that humans have caused it all? I think when you say humans have caused it all, that's to deny that climate ever changed before there were humans. We know the climate changed before there were humans. It was just pointed out here, as recently as the 1800s, the climate has changed. And we know it wasn't humans because we weren't burning fossil fuels like we were. Okay, so I think the burden of proof should be on them not on us to show what natural variability is. Yeah, very good. Yeah, I, I, I agree fully with Barry there. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, I took this out of my talk because of time, but um, if you were around about 1910, the globe had been cooling and there were all Ice Age reports about it. You know, we've been this long Holocene period for 10,000 years the next change is going to be an ice age. Well, they were all talking about it, and then what happened about 1910 to 40 or so, the globe warmed. Now, I was in junior high school, and I gave a talk on the great global warming. The war was on. We were at the end of the war. We were probably going to win the war, but after the war, we were going to sink back into a new dust, uh, a dust bowl era, and we'd have all kind of problems, and then the globe began to cool. And you remember, you all are old enough to remember in the late 70s, all the Ice Age uh, talks come on. And now the globe began, then it began to warm, and Jim Hansen and all the warmers jumped out of the closet. And uh, now we've reached a point since about 1998, there hadn't been any warming. It's probably been more level. But I predicted because of the ocean currents, which I have, have, haven't had time to... Uh, to uh, talk about, but these ocean currents, the deep ocean currents,
can cause temperature change and cause the atmosphere to have more or less rain. And these processes are the main drivers for climate change on this, it, between ice ages. We're in a, the, the, with the ice ages, you've got to bring in the orbital parameters and all this stuff. They are a fundamental factor. But when they're not dominant, as they've not been dominant over the last 1,000, 1,500 years, it's these ocean, deep ocean currents driven by salinity variations that are the main driver for climate change. Now, that doesn't mean solar effects aren't a little bit. Uh, other factors, uh, uh, volcanoes, all this stuff can alter a, li a little bit, but it's not the fundamental driver. Solar effects are not it. Most people are looking, well, if it's not CO2, it's solar. It's not. It's so little. The solar variations are so, are so small compared to the other energy variations that they can't be a major driver. Now, they may have some small effect in the noise level. You will say, I don't believe in global warming, but I, I'll go along with it. You know, they're giving me, my wife uh, uh, needs a new dress, and my kids have got to go to college, and all these sort of things. And uh, I, I don't want to rock the boat. I'll just play along. There's so much of that. And indeed, you've got to earn a living. One of the, what, what is the thing that drives sci scientists most? You think it's truth? No, it's a salary. You've got to eat first because you can become a scientist. And a truth is a holy grail if you tell the truth. I can afford to tell the truth because I've earned my retirement. Now, hopefully they can't take that away. But uh, if I was 20, 30 years younger and was out on the grant field, I would be, I'd, I'd have to change fields because I did not play along. It is there. It is dirty. Politics. Po they appoint the people in the NSF and NOAA and stuff. There's a policy to do this. And if you go along, fine. If you don't, they're going to get you. They may not get you this year, but your next grant may not come through. Or if it comes through, it's going to be minimum money or you're going to have problems. You're not going to be on any committees. You're not going to have any influence. Uh, this is the way it is. It really is that way. And I want to tell you.